And uh, we'll... <clears throat> Okay, we're going to read Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, and we're going to be considering uh, the, the simple question, what mean ye by these stones? And so uh, we'll begin reading in verse 1, and it begins this way, uh, Joshua chapter 4, verse 1, and it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, uh, take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man. And command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man, and Joshua said to them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God, into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests, which bear the ark of the covenant, stood, and they are there unto this day. For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished, that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over, that the ark of the Lord passed over and the priests in the presence of the people and the children of Reuben, the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses spake unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord unto battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. And again, it's lovely to share the word of God with you. I wish I could be there in person uh, in Malaysia, but that's not possible at this time, but it is a joy to be able to share with you from his word. So as you've been going through the book of Joshua, you know that chapter three is pretty much a straightforward account of the miracle of the crossing of the Jordan River. But chapter four contains a lot of what we would call typical teaching. Uh, teaching using types or pictures. The Old Testament is full of these types. And of course, a type, as uh, I'm sure you are well aware, is, is a mark or impression uh, left by a blow. And so it, often that word type is used, uh, for instance, uh, of uh, when coins were minted and say the emperor's head was, was impressed upon it and it left behind it a picture. And uh, it's also used of the nail prints in the hands of the Lord Jesus. There was a, a blow, a mark left, and and there's uh, in his hands. One day we will see there's a there's a picture that once there were nails there. So so God, as it were, stamped pictures all the way through the Old Testament. These typological pictures, and they're very instructive. And so we're going to see quite a bit of typological teaching here. For instance, uh, finally, the children of Israel have crossed out of the wilderness, and they're now about to stand <clears throat> on the land of Canaan, the long-promised land of Canaan. And so we have to think about both the wilderness and, of course, Canaan, and what they mean to us typically. What do they picture? And because you'll often hear 
maybe in gospel songs, <clears throat> people crossing Jordan <clears throat> and going onto Canaan ground. And often it's used as a picture of heaven. And I think inaccurately as a picture of heaven. And so let's just kind of get that clear in our minds before we go any further. So the wilderness, uh, we know, is, is a picture of, of the world. And uh, it's certainly used that way. Uh, Jay and Darby used to say that this world is a wilderness wide. And there's a certain sense in which as Christians, although uh, we're really in, in Canaan, Canaan, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, but we're also still in the wilderness at the same time. We're actually in two places at once. What I mean by that is <clears throat> we're still living in this world. And uh, Second Peter would put it this way, we're living here as strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We're just passing through. We don't really belong here. We're on our way so somewhere else. And this world is a wilderness. So in a certain sense, we're still in the wilderness. But in another sense, we're actually on Canaan ground. And what does that mean? I said that Canaan's not a picture of heaven. It was the promised land. But if you remember, and when you look at the book of Joshua, they're going to go into this, this Canaan land, and they're going to be enemies there. <laughs> There's going to be battles there. There's going to be warfare there. And there's going to come a time that actually Israel are going to be kicked out of the land. And so that would be a poor picture of heaven, wouldn't it? If we uh, considered Canaan to be a picture of heaven, I, I hope we're thinking that our battles will be over when we get to heaven, <laughs> that the warfare will be done. We won't be enjoying any warfare anymore. It'll be all over. Also, when we get there, I hope that we're not going to be kicked out. I'm assuming we'll be there forever, right? So Canaan clearly is not a picture of heaven. So what is it a picture of? It is a picture of heavenly places. Uh, it's that, that realm where it, Scripture tells us, New Testament, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ, far above all. So we're, it's kind of resurrection ground. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. But also, again in Ephesians, there's warfare in heavenly places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers of wickedness in high places. So there's this warfare going on there. So it's really a picture of being in the heavenlies. And so in one sense, Christians were both seated in heavenly places, and at the same time, we're walking through this wilderness world as strangers and pilgrims. We're kind of in two places at once. So I kind of want to get that typology clear in our minds to begin with. Also, just to mention that uh, the key words, <clears throat> excuse me, in this chapter are 12 stones. And three times we <clears throat> have that mentioned to us. It's mentioned in verse 3. Uh, commanded them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, 12 stones. Uh, you see it again, verse 8, The children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones. And then verse 9, And Joshua set up 12 stones. So it's kind of key idea is these 12 stones. And as we know, one representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the spiritual application, of course, is is that these stones were memorial stones, and so they're meant as an aid to memory, to remind people. Uh, you just finished your memorial feast, and you had some emblems on the table that were aids to remember something, to remember something that happened a long time ago, but those very emblems were, were just like these stones. They, they were there to remind of some significant past event that had very serious, marvelous ramifications for them. And so the idea is, uh, the spiritual application, we could say, is these me memorial stones, they're there for one purpose. Uh, we often sing, uh, at least in, in this part of the world, a lovely hymn, and it goes like this, Lest I forget Gethsemane, Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love to me, lead me to Calvary. And so the idea of these memorial stones and the memorial we've just enjoyed together is so that we don't ever forget the amazing things that God has done in the past that have present ramifications to this very hour. So it's uh, calling to mind. Let's go a little bit further in the typical application uh, before we dive into the details of the text. But just to say this, that there was two actual piles of 12 stones. It's very evident when you read the text. 
that there's one pile of 12 stones that are taken from the midst of the Jordan where the priest's feet stood. And those 12 stones are going to be put on the other side, Jordan, the bank across uh, in the promised land as a perpetual reminder that they crossed the Jordan and these very stones were there uh, at the bottom where the ark stood. On the other hand, the very place where the ark stood, Joshua is also going to place 12 stones there. Now they're going to be hidden from view. Uh, the only time they could ever be seen perhaps uh, would be if there was a, a severe drought in the land and that uh, the, the Jordan was so low that you might be able to see those stones. But for the most part, they were only visible to the eyes of God. They were covered by water. So what is the significance of these two piles of 12 stones? Well, again, I do believe it's all a picture, uh, typology again, but very important typology, because it's all to do with the fact that where the ark was and how the ark enabled them to cross Jordan. Remember, it was only when the priests put their feet in carrying the ark that the Jordan parted. And so that ark, the ark of the covenant, we know it's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus, don't we? We recognize that. He's the place where, uh, where uh, well, the, the ark is made of gold, speaks of his, his perfect deity. Uh, it's made of acacia, which speaks of his humanity. And it's the place where, uh, where, in a sense, God's judgment is poured out and where righteousness and and grace is made possible to all of us. And so it's a, it's a marvelous picture of the work of the Lord Jesus. And so what we could say is the stones on the bottom of Jordan are a picture, in a sense, of our death with Christ. Like the, the, that's where the ark stood. And it's a picture of the idea that uh, the bottom of Jordan, you can't see those stones anymore, but the ark was once there. Christ was once in the grave. You can't see that anymore, but he was once there. Uh, he once died. And so, and we, of course, died with him, our, our death with Christ. And then the, uh, the stones on the other side represent the fact that the ark came through the waters and came out to the other side. <laughs> and so it's a picture of Christ risen and our being risen with him. And so that's the, the typical picture here. Uh, the goodbye to the old life. We died with Christ down in the bank of Jordan there, down in the, the center of the, the river. We're risen with Christ uh, on the other side, now on resurrection round. So stone memorials, this chapter is really the subject. Very significant for God to record this is to remind Israel, and we tend to forget so easily, uh, so we need memorials. And there are several times in the, in the scriptures that God tells Israel about how forgetful they are, how they need to be reminded of past things. I'll just give you a couple of examples in Psalm 78. And verse 54, it says, And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which his right hand had purchased. And uh, again, so they needed to be reminded what God had been doing in the past. Psalm 106, again, another one of those reminder psalms because of how easily they forget. And of course, the disciples were like that too. They were quick to forget things. Um, they uh, had seen the Lord Jesus feed 5,000 and then 4,000 uh, people in Matthew chapters 14 and 15. But we find in Matthew 16 that um, <clears throat> they, they had quickly forgotten what the Lord had done in providing so amazingly. And we read in Matthew 16 and verse 7, it says, and they reasoned among themselves, saying, is it because we have taken no bread? <laughs> because they, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason you among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves of 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up. How is it that you do not understand that I spake to you not concerning bread, 
that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And so, again, how quickly the disciples had forgotten these miraculous provisions. Now they were kind of worried because they'd forgotten to take bread with them. And he's the one that can turn stones into bread. He can do whatever he likes. He's so powerful. And so, of course, they uh, recognize this. We have, as we've already heard, we've been given a memorial to help us not to forget, very critical, uh, to keep remembering the Lord until the Lord Jesus comes. So what about these 12 stones? They, they, they're put together in one heap or one pile as a memorial. And it, it's a picture, in a sense, of both the oneness and unity of the 12 tribes of Israel. There are 12 stones, but there's one memorial. And so there's an emphasis on the unity of the 12 tribes here. And uh, there were, as we said, two piles of stones built, uh, one by 12 chosen men on the bank of the river. So we notice that, for instance, in verse 1, it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, the Lord spake to Joshua, saying, take you 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe of man. Now, it's interesting that back in chapter 3, He's already prearranged these men for this purpose. And if you remember from chapter 3, verse 12, he says, now, for, now therefore take you 12 men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man. But he doesn't tell you what these 12 are, are going to, to do. Uh, <clears throat> and so they're selected beforehand, and their job is specifically uh, one from each tribe to pick out a stone from the midst of Jordan. So he says, verse 3, And command you them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. So around the proximity of where the priests kept the ark. This is where they're to select these stones. Twelve stones, you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Of course, that lodging place is a place we're going to learn later in the chapter, a place called Gilgal. Uh, that's going to be the place of their first night lodging in the promised land. And so <clears throat> that's the first pile of 12 stones that we mentioned that are taken out from Jordan. And then the second group of 12 stones, notice in verse 9 and 10, Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. But the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua and the people hasted and passed over. So two different piles of stones, one in the midst of Jordan, one on the bank of the river Jordan on the side, in and side. The 12 stones on the bank of Jordan came out of the midst of the river evidence that God indeed did part the waters and take his people safely across. And that would be a, a constant reminder to them of that safe passage. Stay, stones that were left on the riverbed, only seen by the eye of God. Remember we said, really, it's, it's this typological picture here. I want to go through it again. But <clears throat> I want to suggest to you that the book of Colossians brings this out a little bit. In Colossians 2, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 20, thinking of our connection with the Ark of the Covenant, the picture of Christ, and Colossians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, um, Colossians 2, 20, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? So it's a picture of our death with Christ, uh, that those stones down there. It's like when he died, we died with him. The ark was once there. Now it's on the other ground. We're now risen with Christ. Colossians 3, 1, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's our new place in resurrection ground. The 12 stones hidden in the midst of the river could see, be seen only by God, but they too spoke of Israel's marvelous crossing. Two piles of stones picture Christ's death and burial, the hidden stones, his resurrection, the stones on the bank. They also illustrate 
to us the believer's spiritual union with Christ. When he died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When he rose again, we rose with him in victory as well. We're now living on, as it were, resurrection ground and <clears throat> in, seated in heavenly places with Christ. So these important memorials. What we could say is this, that the Jews could not get victory in Canaan in overcoming the enemy without first going through Jordan. They had to go through Jordan before they could enter the land and before they could have victory over their enemies. And no Christian today can overcome their spiritual foes unless they know what it is to be dead with Christ and also to be, as it were, we, we often say, Romans 6, crucified with Christ and at the same time alive and risen with Christ. That's how we can enjoy victory over our enemies. Now, I want you just to imagine uh, the excitement of this particular chapter for the Israelites because the people of Israel had waited some 40 years for this moment. Having come out of Egypt 40 years before, they now had crossed the final geographical barrier to the land of Canaan. They had come this far, as it were, by faith, and were now called to even greater faith to possess and live in the land of promise. They camped on the eastern side of Jordan for many months. In fact, we go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 22, verse 1. Uh, they'd been there quite some time waiting for this moment to cross the Jordan. Numbers 22, verse 1, the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on the side Jordan by Jericho. Now they were on the plains of, of Jericho near, near, near the city of Jericho. They crossed over. They were, they were now on, as it were, Canaan ground. Uh, and um, what's interesting is that now they've crossed the land, there's no immediate rush to attack Jericho. Uh, by God's direction, Israel had to deal with some important spiritual matters at Gilgal before beginning the conquest of Canaan. We're going to learn about some of those as we continue. But they had to be circumcised. I mean, in a sense, you almost think of this in terms of military suicide. You've crossed over into enemy land. And what's the first thing you do? You incapacitate your military. But God said you can't enjoy victory unless spiritual matters are put in order. And so uh, even though they've crossed over, there's going to be no, as it were, conquest until everything is done decently in order. Things have got to be put right. Notice uh, these uh, chosen men, are to select these stones, they're to, to bring them out, uh, they're to make this pile on, the, on Jordan. And then we notice in verse 4, as we continue through this chapter, it says, Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. Joshua said to them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan. Take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that it may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by these stones? And so the, the whole purpose of this raising of stone memorials, which is very common, by the way, in the Old Testament, was so that children, out of curiosity, might at some point in the future say to their parents, Father, what's this heap of stones here? What's the significance of it? Just as we think of the emblems at the Lord's table, um, when our children are there, it's always good to have children with us. Maybe curiosity. What's all this about? Uh, and of course, it's always good to answer when there's that curiosity in a person's mind. So this, this importance of memorial stones. Let me just show you a few others. Right in the book of Joshua, we're going to see some more raising of stones to remember things. Chapter 7, verse 26 it says, they raised over him, this is over Achan, a great heap of stones unto this day. 
So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. And of course, if anybody saw that heap of stones where Achan was buried, it was a reminder for the, to, to all the people. Uh, important to uh, listen to what God says and act in obedience. Serious consequences of disobedience. Uh, chapter 24 of Joshua. In verse 26 and 27. It says, Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Be Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke unto us. It shall therefore a witness unto you, lest you deny your God. So you can see this is a common uh, idea, setting up memorial stones uh, Genesis 28, Jacob, after he had wrestled all night with the angel, he put up his pillow and made it a pillow, as it were. He made a memorial place. And he said, when I come back, uh, I'm going to uh, stop at this place. And so that, that kind of idea, uh, again, memorials intended to provoke questions. So the story of God's miraculous interventions might be told over and over. Now, it's interesting that it's just an aside here, but it's an interesting one that sometimes we, we get the idea that miracles were happening every single day. And uh, I want to suggest to you that the need of putting up memorials was proof that they weren't everyday occurrences. In fact, there's an economy, economy of miracles in Scripture, but the ones that do take place are intended to be remembered. The great works that God has done and usually these miraculous events have some kind of marker or memorial so that you can remember, call to mind what God has done. So future generations who had not personally experienced the miracle of the Jordan crossing would not be able to forget it because this memorial had been set up by God. Now, no, let's move on. Uh, verses 7 uh, through 9. And we'll, we'll notice it says, and then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Children of Israel did so, as Joshua commanded, took up 12 stones out of the midst of Jordan. As the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, carried them over with them into the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua, of course, then we read about him setting up stones in the middle as well uh, of the river. And so... Finally, the, these memorials were completed. And then verse 11, it says, It came to pass when all the people were clean passed over, the ark of the Lord passed over, and the priests in the presence of the people. So now we have the all the people completely over. And then there's something here that the writer doesn't want us to forget or lose sight of. And it's, it's to do with a promise made by the two and a half tribes that they would enter into Canaan and help fight the battles, even though they intended to dwell on the other side, Jordan. And so the writer wants us to, to recognize this. These Transjordan tribes had a primary role in the conquest of the land of Canaan. And so I want you to notice that. It says... Uh, verse 12, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses spake to them. About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord unto battle into the plains of Jericho. And so they, as it were, went ahead. They were they're kind of pioneering. They were going to go and fight the battles just as they had promised to do. However, we do notice something here, and that is numerically, the number that crossed over to fight the battles was a lot smaller than the overall number of those tribes. And let me show you what I mean by that. If you look back to Numbers 26, 
Numbers chapter 26 and verse 7, it's kind of listing, it says, this is the second numbering in the wilderness. After the generation that had failed at Kadesh Barnea, had died in the desert, now he's numbering the new generation of men able to go to war. Numbers begins with, that's why it's called the Book of Numbers, a numbering of those military prepared. And then there's a second numbering in chapter 26. and verse 7, it says, these are the families of the Reubenites. This is just one of the, uh, the, the two and a half tribes and th that were numbered of them were 40 and 3,730. So that's just one of the two and a half tribes and their number was greater than the combined number that went over. <laughs> and so it would seem that uh, 40,000 crossed over, able to go to war, but the rest of them stayed other side Jordan so that they could protect their flocks, their little ones. And so 40,000 were those, maybe a certain selected out of each of the two and a half tribes that would make up this uh, military uh, expedition force that would help with the battle. And so it says, verse 14, this is an amazing verse. It says, on that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. So Joshua is now, in effect, recognized officially as the new Moses. Remember when they crossed the, the, the Red Sea, it tells us that in that incidence, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and Moses, his servant, kind of almost a parallel. Let me just go back there. Exodus 14, uh, the crossing of the Dead Sea, the Red Sea, Exodus 14, verse um, 30, uh, 31 it said, and Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So as Moses, as it were, brought the people across the Red Sea, people recognized his authority, they, they, they reverenced his leadership, they feared him. And now we find the very same thing happening to Joshua in after the crossing of the Jordan. Up to now, in a sense, in people's minds, maybe Joshua had been just seen as a servant, humbly serving, serving in Moses' shadow, learning the ways of God. Now was the time of his exaltation. Now was the time for people to recognize him. And it's true, isn't it? The Lord Jesus says, he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 14, verse 11. And so here's this man, he had humbled himself, he'd been a servant for Moses, and now he was now being recognized, as it were. Now, just another kind of an interesting thought here, but uh, one that I think has significance. So this place of crossing, the passage of Jordan, where they crossed over at Gilgal, uh, where they first encamped, where the stones were set up, I want us to just look at a verse in John's gospel for a second, chapter one, concerning the baptism of the Lord Jesus. And he gives us a kind of little hint at where he, his baptism took place. It says, these things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. And this phrase, uh, Bethabara, it literally means house of passage, house of passage. And some suggest that it's actually the crossing point where Joshua crossed with the children of Israel, the Jordan River. If that's the case, it's very interesting, isn't it? That when we think of John baptizing and one of the locations that he baptized, this place called Bethabara, Looking back at Matthew's gospel now, chapter 3, verse 9. When the Pharisees came to witness John baptizing, he 
said some things to them. And so verse 7, he says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, this is Matthew 3, verse 7, come to the baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And here's the thought. And again, I wouldn't be dogmatic about this, but I, I thought it was interesting. If, if this passage of Jordan, this crossing point, is the same point, what stones was he talking about when he says, from these stones, I'm able to raise up children <laughs> for Abraham? Could it be the very stones that were memorial stones that were set up there at Gilgal uh, as a reminder? Just an interesting thought. And uh, no doubt, it would have been pointing to those very stones that would have still been there to that day, places memorial to Joshua's day, and a greater than Joshua would be baptized at that very same place. Now, just want to talk a little bit now uh, in our Joshua passage, just a little bit about the the Gilgal section. And uh, it's just very significant because you've crossed over and uh, we, we notice just kind of verse 15, the Lord spake to Joshua saying, command the priest that bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priest saying, come up out of the Jordan. So you, you get the chain of command here. The Lord speaks to Joshua. Joshua commands the priests. The priests obey. And so we'll just say everything here. The Lord told Joshua. Joshua told the people. The command was obeyed. And so there's a great obedience at this time to the word of the Lord amongst the people of God. And so he commands the priests that bear the ark of the testimony. They come out of Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, come up out of Jordan. Verse 17, 18, it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan. The soles of the priests' feet were lifted up unto the dry land that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place and flowed over all the banks as they did before. Can you imagine the impact this would have on that generation as they witnessed the priests? They saw the priests put their feet in, the waters parted, and now the very moment the priests' feet come out, the waters close up that instantaneously and cover up the, the, the dry land where they had crossed. And then verse 19, the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. So now very significant. There's no turning back. The waters have closed behind them. They're in enemy territory. Um, they're, they're in, they can't, this retreat is impossible. A new page in their history has begun. The desert was as unreachable for them as Egypt was. They were now in the land of promise. And it's amazing because it really it's 500 years have passed since the first kind of promise about this land had been made. And now they're finally in the land. And they're at a place called Gilgal. Gilgal was strategically located, a great place for them to be, because the Jordan provided security on the one side of them, right? No enemy is going to come through Jordan at flood stage, so they're safe behind them. But also, they have the open plain before them. So there's no surprise attack going to happen. Anybody comes, they'll be seen. And so this is why Gilgal was so significant. In fact, as you go through the book of Joshua, one of the key ideas is back to Gilgal. They're going to, this is going to be, as it were, their headquarters for their military campaign and they'll keep on coming back here because it's a safe place to have the encampment security of the jordan behind you the plains of jordan in front of you you're in a very safe spot also there's an abundant supply of water provided by the river and so it was israel's base of operation for some time let me just show you that they keep coming back there uh, joshua 10 and verse 15 Joshua 10, 15, it says, 
And Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp of Gilgal. Chapter 10 and verse 43, it says, Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. Joshua 14 and verse 6, it says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, and so on and so forth. But again, they came to Joshua in Gilgal. So that's clearly the place. And so back to Gilgal, a continual theme. Now, what's interesting is, when do they set up camp? Notice verse 19. The people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. What's significant about the 10th day of the first month? Well, wasn't that Passover from Leviticus 23? You see, on the 10th day, that's when they were to select a lamb. That's when the Passover officially began. They, they had to pick a lamb, and then they would keep the lamb. And then on the 14th day, then they would kill the lamb. And so it's kind of interesting that their arrival in the land, the anniversary, is the same time as Passover, when they were first delivered from Egypt. And now they're in the land of promise uh, as a result of that. Of course, they're going to remember the Passover after circumcision. So verse 20, it says, These twelve stones which they took out of Jordan, did Joshua pitch in Gilgal? He spake to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. The Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over. And the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. So again, likening the miracle to the to the same as the Dead Sea, he does the same for Jordan. And the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. And so we find subsequent generations are to be told the story as if the event had happened to them personally. This is importance, isn't it? Remembrance. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. And then do we understand the typical picture here that we died with Christ, as it were, our old man, like those 12 stones, crucified with Christ at the bottom there of Jordan. And now we're on resurrection ground with Christ on the other side in Canaan land, in the heavenlies, Yes, we're in warfare, all the rest of it. But I hope we understand and grasp the, the the typology. Our time is gone. We should just have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for Joshua, this exciting book. And we look forward even to next week and continuing together in this study. We pray that it would be helpful to thy saints there uh, in uh, Port Klang Gospel Hall. Thank you, Father, again for them. And uh, again, that they've kept a feast this morning and they've held a memorial. They don't want to forget the great things the Lord Jesus has done, the victories he has accomplished, the amazing miracles that have occurred in all of our lives through the work of the Savior. Lord, help us never to forget these things. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.